The following is a presentation of West Publishing Company. Because I go wandering around airports and people come up to me and say, when's the next plane leave for Houston? <laughs> and I got completely demoted one night in San Francisco. I got off an elevator and there was a couple in the elevator with me. As I got off, I heard the woman say to her husband, what was that? And he said, that was a security guard. <laughs> so then I went to Canada to speak at the University of Guelph. I had to go through immigration at the Toronto airport. So I handed my passport to the immigration officer and he looked at it and looked at me and said, what are you? And I said, United States Navy. He took a second real hard look at me. And then he said, you must be the oldest one they've got. You are looking at a living legend, Captain Grace Murray Hopper, the oldest person on active duty in the Navy and a pioneer in the computer industry. She was the third programmer on the first large-scale digital computer in the United States, Mark I. Mark I was all of 51 feet long, 8 feet high, 8 feet deep, had all of 72 words in it. Could do three editions every second. Seems pitiful today because you can put about five, six, ten Mark Ones on one chip. She also helped develop the first commercial computer, Univac One. But she is perhaps best known as the mother of COBOL, one of the inventors of the first COBOL compiler, which made it possible to program computers with English commands rather than unintelligible strings of numbers. This accomplished something most people thought impossible. And she is still going strong. She spends nearly 300 days of each year traveling to colleges, universities, businesses, and computer conventions, sharing her unique insights. Now, actually, I can remember when Riverside Drive along the Hudson River in New York City was a dirt road. And on Sunday afternoons, as a family, we'd go out and sit on the drive and watch all the beautiful horses and carriages go by. In a whole afternoon, there might be one car. Cars were enormously expensive. They were individually built. There were no such things as gas stations. If you went on a trip, you got five gallon cans of gasoline, put them on the back deck, strapped them to the car, and took it with you. Then along came a gentleman named Henry Ford with two concepts, standard interchangeable parts and an assembly line. And he started to build Model Ts. You could have any color you wanted as long as it was black. They cost between $300 and $600, and people started to own cars. I think we've totally forgotten how the world changed, what a revolution that Model T created. Gas stations appeared, garages could stock the interchangeable parts, they appeared. People found they could move to suburbs, drive to work. Then, of course, they wanted to shop near home, we built shopping centers. And we did a pretty good job of managing all that. Yet we totally neglected the underlying thing, which was transportation as a whole. Now, whether you recognized it or not, the Model Ts of the computer industry are here. And I'm very much afraid we'll make the same mistake over again. I'm afraid we'll continue to buy pieces of hardware and put programs on them. But what we should be doing is looking at the underlying thing, which is the total flow of information through any organization, activity, company, or what have you. Do you realize that nowhere has anyone written a paper, a chapter in a book, or anything on the value of information? Some insurance companies are starting to offer to insure you, if you, in case you can't get access to your data or that you lose your data. And there's a wide open question, what is the value of that information? Nothing's been done about it. Nobody's listed the criteria. Nobody's even, by and large, they haven't even made comparative studies within an organization. Which is the most valuable data? What is the value of the data? Now, it's going to be very important when it comes to designing our new online systems. I thought up a couple of curves. I have no numbers to put on them because the research hasn't been done yet. But I think I can talk about the shape of the curves. Suppose this is dollars and this is time. And an event occurs here. Now the value of the information about that event goes up quite sharply immediately after the event. You capture the information about it, you really want it. 
So it goes up very sharply. But then the further you get away from the event in time, that curve levels off. Ultimately, that piece of information is either replaced by a new piece of information, or you decide you don't need it online anymore and you transfer it to the historical files so you can save it for the IRS. So that the value curve probably looks something like that. A sharp rise, a leveling off, and a transfer to history. But what about the cost of that information? The cost of collecting data and information at the time of an event is very low. But the further you get away from it in time, the more it's costing you to store it and maintain it. So the cost curve starts low and then goes zooming up. There's a lovely crossover point there. Beyond that point, it's costing us more to keep that stuff in our online system than it's worth to us. And it's because we don't know where that point is, that we don't know when to get it out. Well, now if it's done something about looking at this aging of data, and it's the Coast Guard. They had a file which contained the complete history of every buoy. And when a ship went out for, to maintain the buoys, they'd look in the file and see what had been done about that buoy over the last couple of years and whether any message had been left to check something next time. Those records had started years ago as a punch card and they'd gotten longer and longer and longer and longer and longer with each year. And the whole system was slowing down. So they took a second look at those records they said, hey, we don't need that whole record on time. All we need is the last two years. We don't need the rest of the record unless we're going in for a budget and we need to know when we bought it and how much we paid for it. So they chopped the records. The front end, the short front end, has stayed online. The rest of it's going back to batch and you can have the answer tomorrow or the next day, which is plenty of time for your purposes. We've totally failed to look at the data and the information which we are processing. And it's something we very much need to know because the amount of data and information is steadily increasing, it's more than linear, and the demand for immediate access to it is increasing. And those two are in conflict. So in order to design our systems of the future, we're going to have to know something about the value of the information we are processing. And I would remind you, we've talked about data processing for some 20 years. But we put all of our time on the processing and practically nothing on the data. And it's high time we began to look at it. Because if you say we're dealing with a system, with a standard chart of a system, we have input, that's data, goes to a process, produces an output, output, which is information. There's some form of control on this, we hope. There's a feedback from the information to the control to change the process. The process consists of hardware, software, communications, and people. We have not properly paid attention to the components of that system. We have not been looking at the value of the data and the information. And by and large, we've looked only at the hardware and software. We're beginning to look at the communications. We haven't paid nearly enough attention to the people. We were building Mark II the summer of 1945. It was a hot summer in Cambridge. Naturally, since it was World War II, we were working in a World War I temporary building. <laughs> no air conditioning, screens weren't very good, Mark II stopped. We finally located the failing relay. It was one of the big signal relays. And inside the relay, beaten to death by the relay contacts, was a moth about this big. So the operator got a pair of tweezers and very carefully fished the moth out of the relay, put it in the logbook, put scotch tape over it, and below it he wrote, first actual bug found. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be glad to know that the bug is still under the, log, under the scotch tape in the log book. It's in the museum at the Naval Surface Weapons Center at Dahlgren, Virginia. Now I've told that story a lot of times, but it turned out some people didn't believe me. Among them, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. So they made an expedition to Dahlgren. And sure enough, they found the bug under the scotch tape in the log book. So they took a picture of it, and they published it in the July 1981 Annals of the History of Computing. So it's the first bug is now legal. <laughs> and I think it's rather nice that the Navy's preserving some of the early artifacts, like the first bug and me and a few other things. <laughs> 
and the only other courses that would credit for my designator were the War College courses. So absolutely terrified, I sent for the first War College course. And they sent me the first problem. I was to fuel a task force at sea in minimum time. And all they told me was how fast the different ships could pump oil and receive oil. And of course, I knew absolutely nothing about fueling ships at sea. But I had to do something. So I lined up an oiler and a carrier and started pumping from the oiler to the carrier. It was perfectly clear that wasn't going to get me any minimum time. Finally, I decided they must have given me the rates for some reason, looked at them again, and found I could simultaneously pump oiler to carrier and carrier to destroyer. And they'd both be filling up because the rates were different. Now, somewhere along the line, somebody had given me a course in problem solving. And they'd told me I must always extend every solution. So I did. I started pumping from a destroyer to a Corvette. Beautiful. <laughs> but that same course had also told me I must generalize every solution. So I did. On the other side of the oiler, I pulled up a cruiser and a destroyer and a Corvette. And I ended up with half a task force, all hitched up with lines, sailing down the middle of the ocean. Uh, my problem was returned with a comment, an interesting solution. <laughs> I decided that wasn't the way you fuel ships at sea. Well, along came the next one. This time they gave me a squadron of submarines, told me to scout the Caribbean minimum time. Well, heck, I knew less about submarines than I did about oilers. So this time I called on my friendly computer to help me, and I used a random walk program for each of the submarines. And you should have seen that map. It was beautiful. <laughs> Only trouble was I had those submarines cutting across each other. They made U-turns, one little circle up here and came back in the pattern again. An interesting solution. <laughs> I was sure I was well on the way to flunking the entire course. But along came the third problem, and that's the one I want you to remember. I was to make a plan to take an island. Then after I completed my plan, I was to make two reviews of it. I was to review my plan in the light of all possible enemy actions, all possible future events. And then I was to review the cost of not carrying out the plan. What would be the consequences of not doing it? Two reviews which should be made for every single plan we make for computers. Yet again and again, I find us making our plans for computers, and the plans are based on the equipment we have in-house, the things we're doing now. And we fail to review those plans in the light of the equipment that will be available and the things that we will be doing. Probably the most dangerous phrase you can ever use in a computer environment is that dreadful one, but we've always done it that way. That's a forbidden phrase in my office. To emphasize the fact, I keep a clock which operates entirely counterclockwise. <laughs> now, of course, the first day you meet it, you have trouble telling time. By the second day, most people discover what used to be 10 hours, now 10 after, and they can tell time.